evening, everybody, and welcome to this panel on the soft power of the European Union. For this, soft, uh, for this panel, I am pleased to let everybody know that we have a special panelist, the Prime Minister of Albania, Mr. Edi Rama, whom we thank to be here with us. And the panel will be moderated by uh, Marta Dassou, uh, Senior European Advisor at La Aspen Institute of Italy and former Deputy Minister for Foreign Affairs of Italy. So this panel is on the soft power of the Union. Why did we choose this item? Uh, the EU is certainly not a military power. It is not a state. Uh, but it is often said that it's uh, certainly present in global affairs, in uh, international affairs, and it's been very effective, especially towards its neighbors. It is often said that the uh, enlargement process is the uh, most powerful means at the disposal of the Union. Uh, also, the neighborhood policy has been very effective in creating an area of peace, stability, and uh, relative prosperity at the borders of the European Union. But this is based on the power of attraction of the Union. Uh, this is the means that we have at our disposal, and this is based on the wish of these countries to join the Union, when is the case, or to have closer ties with the Union. And the question is, is it still um, the case. These countries are still wishing to join the Union or to have closer ties, uh, or is there a kind of enlargement fatigue? These are the things that we will uh, explore during today's panel. And to answer these questions, I'd like to uh, pass the word to Marta Dassou, who will moderate the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Marco. Uh, it's a real pleasure. My duty will be to, tie, uh, to try to stick to the timing. Uh, we just have one hour and a wonderful panel. Edi Rama was already introduced. By, by the way, Edi, you just won a crucial political election in your country, so uh, well done. Uh, we will discuss the implications for the accession negotiations to the EU. But then we have on the screen David McAllister, hello, who is member of the European Parliament and chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament. Merter Mulfuter Batch, she is professor of international relations at the Sabanch University. And Ivan Evoda, <coughs> who is permanent fellow uh, uh, at the Institute of Human Sciences. Even you spent a lot of time in the United States. You are from Serbia yourself, so you can give us a hint of how the accession process is, is going on, how the enlargement is perceived in, in the region. Mark already introduced uh, the topic. We have a credibility crisis of both processes, enlargement and, uh, uh, and the neighborhood uh, policy. We left, as Europeans, a lot of room, in my view, to China, Russia, and Turkey, I have to say, in the region. We have tense relationship with, uh, with Turkey. Uh, we will discuss this problem with, with Melter in, in particular. And we have to decide what would you like to do uh, with the enlargement process, which has been de facto a substitute uh, for foreign policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis the region. So let's start with, with Edi Rama. You won uh, these crucial elections. How do you think that this result is going to affect uh, the negotiations with the EU? Because after all, your people, the Albanians, they remain very much in favor of membership, and still this is a highly polar polarized society in this moment. So which is your feeling now? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it's absolutely true that uh, Albania, there is no importance who wins and who loses in terms of uh, elections when it comes to the European Union, because the Albanian public opinion is uh, very much pro-EU and uh, very much Western-oriented. And by no doubt, 
the European path is not one of the choices for us, but it's the only and the ultimate choice. And if it is true for some other countries in the region that there are other actors with quite uh, an important influence, this I don't think is true for Albania because uh, with all the others, we have different kind of relations, but none of them is a potential substitute of the European Union as uh, our uh, goal, as our destination, as our yeah. partner. So, um, yeah, I think there are many issues that we have to deal with in this period of time. Um, I uh, that you, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, you, you bought a lot of uh, uh, Chinese vaccines, for <laughs> instance, Sinovac. And the guess is whether uh, you see in this relationship with China an important relationship how much it is so, because after all, we are trying to realign ourselves as European in front of this big, huge competition with China. Don't, don't you think it's, uh, it will become a problem? No, we, uh, we were left out of the scheme of distribution uh, of the vaccines in the beginning. Uh, and when I say we, not just Albania, but the whole uh, countries of the Western Balkans, so this uh, neighborhood in the middle of Europe surrounded by, the, by EU borders was practically isolated from the rest in terms of the capacities to fight the pandemic. And uh, we had to make our own run and uh, to make our own efforts individually, all the countries. For us, it went well. We got a direct contract with Pfizer then we got the uh, same with AstraZeneca. And uh, to be accurate, we didn't get Sinovac from China. From Turkey. We got Sinovac from the distributor in Turkey. And um, I would say that our relations with China are absolutely, let's say, normal and the normal in this uh, in these uh, relations is uh, nothing special, nothing special. Thanks uh, a lot. The real problem are uh, reforms. Uh, when, you, when we think in terms of uh, getting a new member into the European Union, clearly uh, we link all that uh, to important internal reforms. And I have to say your country made a lot of progress uh, and the European Union already recognized that. Do you think that you need something more, especially on judicial reform and uh, the fight against organized crime? <laughs> I think uh, we, need to, we need to assess, first of all, uh, who, who is uh, the most uh, eligible uh, source to uh, talk objectively about our reforms and our results. And I think there is none, nowhere in uh, Europe better place than the European Commission to uh, say objectively, based on facts and based on, uh, based on a very, very uh, strict and uh, systematic monitoring of all the process where we stand. And uh, uh, we have learned in the hard way that uh, no matter what, there are always two levels of appreciation. One is the, let's say, more technical level of the Commission, which has a whole staffed uh, delegation in Albania, uh, following up 24-7, all the events, all the progress. And then you go to another level, which is uh, 
more political and more subjective. And uh, we stumble there. It's fine. We understand it. Uh, the important for us is to continue and do what we are doing because it's not that we have to do it based on uh, what people in Brussels or Berlin or, or Paris or wherever ask, but it's uh, what we have to do for our children and for the future of our country. So these reforms are beneficial to the country, are uh, the reforms that we need to do for the next generations, and we do them. And then uh, we have to be patient. We have learned it, so we are very patient uh, until the appreciation um, is made also in the level of the political decision-making in the Council, because we know very well that uh, different dynamics in different countries are more and more influential on the decisions, and uh, it's not necessarily about what you do. Of course, what you do is important, but it's uh, also very important what they need in that moment. And, uh, so uh, we had faced it several times, and now nothing surprises me. Uh, we can do all needed, and uh, we can still be in limbo. It's fine, no problem. We, we know that uh, what is important is to do our job, and we know that beyond that we don't have much power to change things. So if one country has elections, uh, next uh, six months, another country has a problem with, uh, I don't know, uh, political debate on uh, immigrants. Another country needs to make a statement about enlargement. So to have everyone in a full consensus about uh, the next step for us or for others, it's more and more difficult. You're right, it's a bit sad to say so, but it's uh, the reality. Yesterday, in any case, in London, the G7 foreign ministries gave an important backing to the actual opening of these negotiations with, with your country and North Macedonia. There was this famous veto by, by Bulgaria, but that was overcome. Uh, listen, uh, can you tell us your perception on the Kosovo problem at this point? Uh, because there is a, a sort of um, German uh, and Franco non paper circulating around. Uh, there was some polemics about the fact that the Premier of Kosovo voted in your elections, and then clearly there is uh, the, the posture of Serbia. What do you think? It's a solvable issue at this point? I, I think that, first of all, our best uh, way to move further is to agree to disagree on what is not solvable uh, in the immediate uh, time and to work together with all the countries in the region on what is possible. And uh, in my view, we have to do all our best to achieve a regional Schengen area where the four freedoms of Europe are applied. So uh, freedom of movement of people, goods, capital services should be applied for all the countries. And so we have a much larger space of uh, economic and social interaction. And, of course, this uh, will also help to make uh, the atmosphere more benign when it comes to go to the hot topics. On the other hand, I, I strongly believe that uh, it's crucial, it has always been, and it's crucial what Germany and France will want to do in that, uh, in that uh, regard, when it comes to the, to the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue, because uh, uh, it has been dragging on for a long time, and sometimes it has been seen, I think, I think not correctly, but still, this has been the, the feeling in the, in the, in the uh, both countries as something left in a, in a lower level than the top level. And I think bringing it up to the top level and uh, having uh, both the Chancellor of Germany and the President of France uh, full hand in it, of course, 
yeah. than so. with all the all the the others uh, involved in their daily job will be absolutely very very important because otherwise i don't see how the both sides can do it uh, in their own which would have been the best but uh, i don't think it's possible yeah let me involve uh, david mccallister in this conversation about the future of enlargement uh, hello uh, david from from brussels i see you on my screen uh, maybe you can comment on that. Uh, do you think that the enlargement process is still alive or stalled? And do you have a, a question or a message to pass through to the Prime Minister of Albania? Please, David. Thank you and warm greetings from the European Parliament here in Brussels. Uh, first of all, dear Eddie Rama, let me congratulate you to your victory at the parliamentary elections in Albania and good luck uh, for the new term and good luck for the future development of your country. As chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the European Parliament, of course, I'm following the enlargement process very carefully. Uh, I believe that enlargement still has a future and all six countries of the Western Balkans have a European integration perspective. Now, we often talk about what enlargement countries have to deliver, and we know how challenging it is to fulfill all the criteria, the political, the economic, and the judicial criteria. But I would like to talk also about the European Union's responsibility. Our credibility depends on our ability to effectively operate as a community of jointly agreed rules and values. And let me be very clear, internally and externally, with no double standards. And coherence, the rule of law, reconciliation and solidarity are the foundations on which the European Union's soft power rests. But this can be undermined, fragmentation, unilateralism, democratic backsliding, and if you then add hybrid interference campaigns, including disinformation, you will receive the full perception of where the EU and its enlargement policy stands today. And then that's one point what I see critically, delays in fulfilling promises made by the EU member states do not help the collective EU credibility. And I would like to name here, the promise given to Kosovo for visa-free travel and also the promise to begin accession negotiations with, Northern, with North Macedonia and Albania. So we also have to deliver and I do hope that we can move forward in this term with opening further chapters with Montenegro and Serbia and also kicking off finally, the accession negotiations with Albania and North Macedonia. Thanks a lot, David. Maybe before turning to the Turkey issue, which is a big issue a bit later on, Ivan, maybe on this Kosovo issue again, do you have something to add, especially on, on the perspective from, from, from Serbia, may, maybe? Uh, please, Ivan. You have to, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Marta. Uh, and it's great to be with you all. And I also congratulate the Prime Minister of Albania, Eddie Rama. And I had the pleasure of spending a week in his lovely country just, just recently. Uh, specifically on Kosovo, I don't have much to add to what the Prime Minister said. I think it's very important to keep the lines of communication open. The dialogue, it was important that uh, the EU Commission and Council received both President Vucic and Prime Minister Albin Kurtri during the last week, met all the highest officials, and I think messages were very clear, uh, both on domestic reform, the need to comply with the acquis communautaire. Um, High Rep. Uh, Joseph Borrell was clear to President Vucic that the democratic reform, alignment with EU foreign policy, and continuing the uh, negotiations with Kosovo to achieve full normalization were very clear. And of course, the messages to Pre Prime Minister Kurti. So 
um, just as Prime Minister said uh, about, uh, you know, elections getting involved in movement forward on a number of issues, so elections in our Western Balkan regions do slow down the process of, uh, of negotiations because we have to wait for stabi political stability in, in the countries. Nonetheless, you know, I would like to, to state very clearly you know, we, uh, both citizens and leaders that we elect in the region, have to ask ourselves the question, do we want a situation like between India and Pakistan and have an unresolved Kashmir issue for 70 years or an unresolved Cyprus issue for 45 years? And simply, is the status quo something that, that is conducive to what all countries have decided, and that is joining the European Union? That has made it very clear that you cannot enter if you have unresolved territorial issues. Sure. Uh, th this is a typical issue on which, in any case, the European Union show important divisions. Uh, David, don't you think that to, to make a real step forward in the direction of what Ursula von der Leyen declared, the need for a geopolitical union, in a sense, we will need to apply a different criterion, a majority question also in foreign policy and security, because otherwise these divisions will continue to, to, to play a, an, an obstructive role, to put it this way. On Kosovo, just to add what Ivan just said, uh, Prime Minister Kurti was on the Foreign Affairs Committee of the European Parliament last week. Uh, he was meeting uh, all high-level representatives of the European institutions and across party lines, we made very clear that the dialogue is the only way forward and hopefully we can get the dialogue now going in June uh, with a high-level meeting between President Vucic and Prime Minister uh, Kurti. Now, when it comes to foreign affairs in general, the European Union, on Monday, we will see the kickoff of the new conference on the future of Europe. And my wish is that also this conference on the future of Europe will perhaps come up with some new fresh ideas. What can we actually do to become stronger, better, more effective and more assertive as regards our European foreign and security policy. When it comes to trade, we're a global power. We have eye level with any power in the world. But when it comes to foreign affairs, security and defense, we all know that there is a lot of untapped potential which we need to unleash. Or as former Commission President Jean-Claude Juncker rightly said, it's about Weltpolitikfähigkeit, creating one of these new German words, but we all understand what is meant. Um, I think three points are key. First of all, we need a joint strategy as European Union. Second, we need to be much more united. And third, we have to combine the strong elements we have as regards soft power with more and more hard power. And that's why the further development of the common security and defense policy of the European Union is in the end linked to strengthening the CFSP. Many, many proposals have been made by many institutions. Also the European Parliament has been very clear with our concrete proposals in our annual reports, what we could do. Uh, I do hope that Josep Borrell will be able to reform the foreign policy of the European Union and that the geopolitical commission, which is a big word, will then actually also be fully implemented in practice. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, one, two questions from, from you, from, from the floor, also from, from the audience. One is, what could Albania has to offer to the EU in terms of security and geopolitics? If you could reply, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, adding two subsets, if I may. 
One on, on the relationship with Turkey, which is, which is becoming an actor in the Western Balkans, a very important one. And, this, and, and the other one on regional cooperation, because you are one of the leaders of this regional cooperation exercise, and uh, we would be interested to, to know a bit more about it. Please. And then I, I move I, to Mufta. I think on one side for, for us and uh, Sometimes it's uh, struggling to make it clear because uh, there are different uh, uh, opinions coming from outside uh, about uh, our way to uh, approach uh, Europe. Uh, it's very, very clear that uh, for us Europe is not an alternative to anything. Europe for us is a religion. Uh, Europe for us is a place that has the same value today that, than it had when the founding fathers imagined it. So um, maybe we are naive, maybe we are like everyone before a marriage that <laughs> is so much enthusiastic about it uh, that doesn't want to know about uh, uh, alternative experiences on the marriage, but uh, this is uh, what it is. So we don't see any other uh, factor or actor as an uh, alternate to, to Europe. And uh, as I said, for us, the integration process is a fantastic tool to modernize our country and to make uh, Albania a full-fledged European state, ready to become member of the European Union, but member or not member, to be a European state. And on the other hand, uh, I strongly believe, and uh, this is of course um, the humble view of the Prime Minister of the small Albania, but still, it's a, I have a very strong view on it that Europe, European Union needs us, uh, not only Albania, but the Western Balkans, as much as the Western Balkans needs the European Union. It's not, uh, and exactly for, for the exactly same purposes as some uh, uh, players or some actors um, advocate the contrary for the purpose of more secure, more safe, more integer union. Uh, it's, uh, it's absolutely not uh, clear to me how it can be a discussion about that, to have, uh, to have this neighborhood that is surrounded by the European borders, by EU borders. We are surrounded by EU borders. We are, we are within Europe. Sure. Uh, and to have this neighborhood not fully integrated, but just like a possible um, gray zone where other interests and other actors can uh, interfere, it's, uh, I think, very, very obvious that uh, the option uh, of, of full integration is much more feasible and much more safe than the option of uh, whatever, uh, you know, collaboration by leaving space uh, for others. And for, for, uh, as, as for Turkey, I, I have my strong view that uh, Turkey is fundamental for the security and the safety of the European Union. And there is no question about that. So uh, uh, now the history of this uh, relation is too long and too complicated. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, by no doubt, uh, in my view, uh, Turkey is key for the safety and security of the European Union, and uh, the European Union is, in my view, uh, key for a stronger Turkey. So um, uh, when it comes to the region, I have to say, and uh, when it comes to Albania, I have to make it very clear, we have, a very, we have a very good relation with Turkey. It's a traditional relation. Uh, for us, Turkey is a strategic partner. 
Um, our relation with President Erdogan is excellent, uh, but I want to make it very clear. There is no, no sign, not, not fact, but sign of what some uh, sources have claimed and continue to claim that, uh, that President Erdogan and Turkey are exercising uh, in Albania or in the region. I don't know, maybe some things can be, uh, can be discussed uh, when it comes to Bosnia and Herzegovina, Herzegovina but not now, before. Uh, about uh, the so-called uh, Ottomanization, neo-Ottomanization, all, all this bullshit. There is nothing of the sort, and uh, I, I've, I, I'm sometimes uh, angry when I see and I read uh, total fake uh, uh, news about uh, mosques being built uh, in, um, in Albania to exercise uh, this kind of influence about uh, whatever else. No, it's not true. Uh, when it comes to mosques, uh, we are very thankful about a whole project of uh, restoration of national heritage uh, sites, uh, being uh, mosques or being churches or being, uh, being uh, other uh, holy places, uh, where we have had also, among others, from European Union, from uh, uh, different donors, uh, also the, the contribution of the Turkish sites. And uh, this is it, uh, this is it. And the other thing uh, is the Mosque of Tirana, where they have, they have uh, contributed to the, to the Muslim community after having had the big cathedral and the big Orthodox, uh, so Catholic and Orthodox cathedral, the big mosque uh, is, is the one missing and the uh, Tur uh, Turkish, uh, Turkish uh, Muslim community has contributed to that. So uh, I don't see any, any, in any way, any kind of, we have, for example, uh, the issue of uh, maritime delimitation with Greece. It's an issue that enters in the category of uh, problems uh, that uh, concern also Greece and Turkey, but never ever we had any kind of push any kind okay. of influence from the Turkish side to do whatever uh, in that regard. We, we, we are completely independent, free okay. and sovereign and nothing uh, of that. Thank you, Thank you uh, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, let's have a, a round on, on Turkey then, starting with uh, Professor uh, Muftuler Bach. Uh, I don't know, have, have you seen this very recent poll from the German Marshall Fund? on uh, Turkish opinion on the European Union. That was very interesting because on the one side, more than half of the population remains pro-European at heart, 62% uh, if, if I'm right uh, among the young population. But then there is a very, very high skepticism about the possibility of becoming a member. Uh, please, Melter, you have the floor. Okay, thank you, Marta. Now, uh, the German Marshall Fund uh, public opinion survey was conducted in 2017, and the end result is not surprising in the sense that Turkey always had a very strong uh, European vocation. And I think one of the things that we need to underline and note here is the fact that, uh, and you know, I'm just repeating something that some of you might already be familiar with, is the fact that Turkey has applied to become part of the European economic community, the EU's predecessor in 1959, and along with the Greeks. And Greece and Turkey have this very special status. And after the uh, Greeks uh, have become members in 1981, it only you know, left Turkey with that kind of a status. They were given this associate membership position, which brought an eligibility for eventual membership, the Ankara Treaty. And Turkey's European vocation, I think, is you know, very straightforward. It never changed in terms of the dedication to become part of the larger European order and eventually to join the European Union as a full member. And one of the most important things that we need to underline here, which 
is directly part of the uh, team of the panel, uh, the soft power of the European Union, we need to note here is that the EU has been a very, very effective player in bringing about significant political change in Turkey. And when it became a candidate country in Helsinki in 1999, the you know the euphoria in the country was so high that everybody you know every group from the you know young to the old from those you know who come from the more social democratic background to the more conservative parties they were all more or less dedicated to preparing the country for eventual eu accession so i call the period from 1999 to 2006 to a certain extent 2007 these golden years of Turkey's political change and Turkey's relations with the European Union. And then suddenly there was a rupture in the sense that, and the rupture has a lot to do with some of the things that took place on the EU part, on the Turkish part as well. And, you know, I see the pattern emerging, which repeated in the Western Balkans, in the EU's, uh, you know, other countries with whom it has these new types of relationships, the European Union's credibility took a very heavy toll with number of vetoes. And I'll just give you one example. When in uh, June 2007, the European Commission and the Turkish government together prepared these three different chapters that Turkey was ready for uh, opening for negotiations, uh, one of the heads of state uh, in the European Council, and I'm not, not going to name him, uh, said, no, 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 I'm, I'm vetoing this. This is, um, you know, Turkey is meeting the technical criteria for the EU accession in this chapter. And if you open this, that would preclude the uh, fact that we have, you know, we would be acceding, we would be negotiating a session, which is precisely why the negotiations were opened in 2005 to start with. So multiple signals, the, you know, the open-ended nature of the negotiations, multiple uh, chapters, vetoes that came from different member states, they all came together in creating a situation, the decision to have a referendum by the French and the Austrian governments, even if and when Turkey completes negotiation for all the 35 chapters, all added up to this you know, final conclusion. Uh, for the Turkish people, it meant that no matter what we did, preparing ourselves for you know, final accession, eventually something will happen and that that final outcome will never be a session. That in return harm the European Union's credibility in the Turkish eyes. So I find it, you know, admirable in the sense that Turkish people are still very much dedicated to both the goal of EU accession and there is a very high level uh, support, especially among the young people, age 20, age 18 to 24, yeah. supporting the EU accession. Uh, thank you, uh, David. Maybe there is one question from from the audience, uh, more or less in the same direction. That is that the the stalling of the process has contributed itself uh, to a certain backsliding of the situ of the internal situation in Turkey. Uh, and then there is the thesis exposed by by Edi Ramia, according to which. The reality is that we need, as Europeans, to have a strong relationship with Turkey, in any case, for security reasons. Which is your view on that? Well, needless to say that Turkey is indeed a country of strategic relevance, not only a neighbor, a major trading partner, and a NATO ally. But EU-Turkey relations have gone through a very difficult and unfortunate phase. And to put it in the briefest way possible, we need to strike a balance between dialogue and cooperation on the one hand, as well as standing up for our values we believe in on the other. And Turkey has now for many years pursued a continuous and, how can I put it in diplomatic terms, growing distancing from European values and standards, which conclude at least the already mentioned backsliding on the rule of law and fundamental rights, adopting regressive institutional reforms, and, and I want to be very clear here, pursuing a confrontational and hostile foreign policy 
including towards the European Union as a whole, and especially our member states, Greece and Cyprus. And I think it's fair to say that Turkey needs to take the blame for the enormous amount of tensions which arose in the Eastern Mediterranean. And still, we reach out as European Union. I support the High Representative and Vice President Josep Borrell's approach to engage with Turkey in a phased and a proportionate and reversible manner. Uh, the European Council will be meeting in June and they will then take stock where we stand and take it from there. So the ball, and that's my final point, the ball is in the court of President Erdogan, but we need a real, sincere and sustainable commitment of the Turkish leadership to improve our relations. Action speaks not words. And a final point on the enlargement process with Turkey. Uh, in the moment, things are in the deep freeze and the European Parliament has been very clear that in these circumstances, it simply doesn't make sense to, uh, to continue the negotiations. So, but when we won't decide this, it's up to the member states to decide that the negotiations are in the deep freeze in the moment, full stop, and President Erdogan will have to answer these questions, not we. Strong, strong words, I have to say, but I, I personally agree. And what about yourself, Ivan? On Turkey, you mean? Uh, on Turkey, first of all. On Turkey and the, and the Western Balkans. No, well, uh, I agree on Turkey. Uh, clearly, uh, as, as the Prime Minister said, is of strategic importance on the eastern, southern eastern flank of both the European Union and NATO. Uh, given the crisis in the Middle East, uh, Turkey has a role to play. But on the other hand, the backsliding of democracy, the internment of journalists, of civic society actors is not something that one uh, wishes to see. And efforts to liberate some of them have unfortunately been uh, unsuccessful. So uh, I, I do agree that the ball is in Turkey's court to uh, send them out a hand and to calm down the, the situation. With regards to, to the Western Balkans and to the question posed in our panel, I do believe that the soft power in the EU uh, uh, neighborhood is still working, even though uh, there is rightly uh, fatigue that, that we witness. Some say that uh, fatigue in EU member states, but fatigue uh, of patience, of waiting, in, in the Western Balkans. Um, you know, there have been rather radical proposals uh, taking all of the six uh, Western Balkan countries immediately into membership. Uh, I rem remind this is 18 million people in, in the six countries to sort of less radical ones, uh, such as make all these uh, countries candidates immediately and start negotiating. And I fully support the, the, the quickest possible opening of negotiations with, with Albania and, and North Macedonia and what David McAllister said about giving visas to Kosovo. I think it's, you know, to use maybe a strong word, outrageous that uh, Kosovo does not have a visa-free uh, travel regime, even though countries such as Ukraine and Moldova do. Kosovo is the only one that, that doesn't have that. And thus, uh, I think that uh, it's a combination that we need of both geopolitics and geoeconomics. The space that has been opened by a uh, sort of waning of activity of the European Union in the region has allowed for the so euphemistically called third actors, whether it's China, Russia, Turkey, the uh, Gulf states to, to come in and do a, a variety of uh, operations of investment and infrastructure. Uh, these, all of our countries need infrastructure, need highways, need higher speed railways. And I think that the European Union needs to wake up to the fact that it needs to come in either through the EBRD, through the European Investment Bank or, or the, working closely with the, with the World Bank uh, to come in and uh, occupy that, that space uh, that where others have 
have walked in uh, because uh, this is really uh, a new and, and changing Europe, a Europe in a changed world. And I would like to add here something that we haven't mentioned. That is the role of the United States and the importance of NATO. Uh, let me just remind that three member states uh, of the Western Balkans, uh, Albania, Montenegro and North Macedonia are full-fledged members of NATO. So the Euro-Atlantic umbrella has come over half of this region fully. And the fact that we have a new administration in Washington that has pledged to work on what in Washington is called, as you all or some of you know, unfinished business of making Europe whole, free and at peace is very important because frankly, to go back for a second to the Serbia Kosovo issue, I don't think we will see a normalization and a resolution without the United States and the European Union working hand in hand uh, on, on this key unresolved uh, territorial issue uh, in the region. And thus a combination of the two is, is important. And there is a good sign, I think, uh, in the meeting that President Vucic had with uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, just last Monday, I believe, where she uh, promised that there would be an investment uh, significant of probably 700 million uh, euros for building a high-speed railway uh, between uh, Belgrade and North Macedonia, which means to Greece and to Turkey on the other side. Yeah, a very, very important point. I have uh, one question for uh, David McAllister from, from the audience concerning, you mentioned before the conference on the future of Europe, and the question is, do you think that representatives from the Western Balkans uh, would, would, have, would be allowed to, to, to take part into this debate or not? They will, they will take part or not? I have always argued very actively that we definitely need to involve our six Western Balkan partner countries and that we need some kind of engagement, some kind of participation of representatives from these six countries, parliamentarians, civil society. Uh, I'm not responsible for the setup of this conference, but yeah. we need them on board. I'll just tell you why. This is the conference on the future of Europe. And we want the Western Balkan countries to join our family of nations in the future. So that's why it makes sense if we're already starting to discuss, discuss how the European Union of the next 50, 20, 25 years might look like, then we should already have representatives from our future members on board. I, I would say, I would add also that uh... You know, politics uh, is uh, a lot about semantics, and uh, it sounds um, not right when some countries that are European Union discuss future of Europe, not of European Union, future of Europe, yeah. and they completely dismiss a whole part of Europe, which is the which is uh, the Western Balkans. And I would say, I'd say, uh, productive discussion uh, about the future of Europe, again, not European Union, because if they discuss the future of the European Union, it's up to them to open or not open to others. But when it comes to the future of Europe, productive discussion would absolutely imply the inclusion not only of the Western Balkan countries, but also of Turkey, to just have a discussion, an open discussion that, uh, of course, will lead to conclusions that then the European Union will, uh, will uh, take stock, the others will take stock, and uh, will bring things in another level. I think there is a lot of need for open dialogue, open and inclusive debate, even when it comes to the Western Balkan conflicts, because uh, uh, without opening up the debate big time and without including uh, in a very, very uh, open and blunt way all the actors, then uh, the risk is to stumble and at the end to always prefer the status quo instead of uh, going for a change that absolutely need to have a 
to have an inclusiveness in the, in the basics and need to have everyone feel on board, being or not being uh, uh, fully, fully okay with, uh, with the uh, final assumptions. I think this is a fair point. I suspect that the conference, in reality, is about the future of the European Union, I have yeah, to yeah, say. Yeah, but semantics, but semantics is important. Semantics yes. is yeah. important, and there is always this confusion between the two terms. Uh, uh, Melter and David, if it is possible, if we agree that the relationship with Turkey uh, is for the moment being at least, but probably for a very long time, not about enlargement, not about membership. Which kind of relationship are we building up? For instance, modernization of the customs union is something of big interest for, for, for Turkey or not. The migration pact, uh, which is important for, uh, for the European Union. These two, uh, these two lines of communication are valuable or not, Melter? Okay, let me actually uh, you know, address this very quickly. But before I do that, uh, let me also point out this fact that there are many Turkeys and there is a tendency, especially when the European institutions you know, are dealing with Turkey, to oversimplify what Turkey is into generally one actor. And that's actually a mistake because, you know, things change over time and then you know, power positions change and there will be other actors in the future too. So it would be wrong to basically uh, harm or, you know, uh, eliminate the existing linkages with the you know, with Turkey based on certain current political situations in any, you know, in any country, in Turkey or in the European Union as well. Now, that being said, uh, you know, what kind of a future, this is what Marta is actually asking, yeah. What kind of a future are we looking at with regards to Turkey and the EU? And I don't see, despite the fact that, you know, the negotiations are still on the table, nobody has frozen them. Uh, I totally agree with David that they are de facto frozen and then nobody is admitting that. But that doesn't change the fact that Turkey and the EU belong together in multiple different ways. And it's not only trade or customs union or migration, it's also about, you know, social interactions, education. I'm part of, you know, major H2020 projects. I have these, you know, European partners that I have been collaborating forever now, more or less. Uh, two societies, European, if I take the EU societies as one and Turkish societies, they're very much integrated. So all of these ties are at such a level of uh, development that I don't think it's going to be reversed. I don't see a rupture of Turkey European Union in a sense that, you know, with or without membership, there are, you know, there are totally different uh, future scenarios. The modernization of the customs union is now, well, it has been on the table for the past five years, but it's now becoming a more reality. But with regards to security cooperation, migration cooperation, energy cooperation, justice and home affairs related matters, I think Turkey and the EU are now, you know, <laughs> That of Thanks. what we call differentiated integration. So that's, you know, it's going okay. to remain part of the European order. Turkey is going to be part of the European order, but probably in a different format than a traditional form of a membership. Thank you, uh, David. And also there is one additional question from, from the audience, North Macedonia. Uh, is going to, to become a new Turkey in the sense that these Beatles could, in theory, go, uh, go, uh, go on forever. So North Macedonia risks to become another, another Turkey in a small scale. During my last visit to Turkey at the beginning of 2020, I once again, as you just said, uh, got to know there is another Turkey. There is a democratic liberal, open-minded, tolerant Turkey, uh, a Turkey we got to know uh, very well and was one of the reasons why the accession negotiations started in 1999. But in the moment, we have to deal with the regime, with the government of President Erdogan. And unfortunately, uh, the violation of fundamental rights and freedoms simply remains the main obstacle to progress on any positive agenda 
that could be offered to Turkey as regards the enlargement process. Uh, we're simply going nowhere and there's been a very unfortunate backsliding. But the other point is also important. As I mentioned, I support the high representative in his approach to engage with Turkey in a face proportionate and reversible manner. And from our point of view, this entails reviewing and possibly enhancing cooperation, for instance, in a number of areas of common interest, including the customs union or migration. But the first step needs to be a real change in Turkish attitude. And Ankara needs to understand we can only settle disputes in the Eastern Mediterranean through dialogue and not through un unilateral threats. And that's why in practice, and here, the EU member states, Greece and Turkey, uh, Greece and Cyprus, sorry, have the solidarity and support of all other EU member states. We have to be very clear that we will simply not accept illegal drilling activities or any kind of similar behavior. And a final point, one big, or rather big elephant remains in the room, namely the issue of Cyprus. Uh, and this challenge remains connected to all Eastern Mediterranean conflicts. So in parallel, the European Union will continue to put extra effort to keep supporting United Nations activities to try to untie this knot. Thank you. We really have three minutes left. So uh, give me uh, the possibility to, to let you know about the results uh, of our polls. Uh, there was this first question, do you think that the, Euro the European Union soft power has been effective in promoting democratization and Europeanization of the Western Balkans? And to my surprise, a large majority, yes. It was fairly effective, while uh, a 33% reply not effective, but the majority thinks it is effective, so maybe our idea that the European Union is, is losing its uh, soft power is a bit too pessimistic. And the other question was, uh, which of these accession countries would you support for joining the EU sooner? Albania comes uh, first in the list, 54%, uh, North Macedonia second, 23%, Serbia to the very bottom, 0%. So I would ask one minute to, uh, to Eddie and one minute to Ivan uh, to comment uh, on this last uh, well, poll. You know, with all we, have, we, are, we are experiencing, there is a, there is a new fresh joke uh, about Euro pessimism and Euro optimism in Albania. And uh, Euro optimists now they say Turkey will become a member under Albanian presidency. <laughs> the Euro pessimists say Albania will become a member under Turkish presidency. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, you know, I think uh, joining is a big word. And uh, frankly, if uh, you would ask me today, is Albania ready to be member of the European Union? I would say no. We are not ready to be member of the European Union. But what I don't understand is the, the postponing and postponing and postponing of starting the real work on the negotiations after the decision has been made yeah. in uh, 2018 uh, to open the negotiations, because this is the real work the country needs. And then, uh, you know, uh, when it comes to accept or not to have a new member, First, this will need time. Second, our European friends can uh, rely to the Turkish uh, model and can say, no, wait, 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 because we are not uh, sure. yet ready. But to keep the countries, or at this time Albania, in this kind of position to say no, and then 
You, we know very well why is no. Is no because some other countries have some other problems, and to add to the pile, you have to do this, you have to do that. No, you have, yeah. but you have also to do this. It doesn't make really much sense, and it looks quite schizophrenic, if I would say. And then with this North Macedonian thing, and the Pandora box of history being opened and entering the relations between a country and the European Union because of another country having historic problems to solve, this can become a big, big uh, blow up for everyone. Imagine when Serbia will be uh, there and Croatia will say, let's see a bit yeah. history because this, there is something there we need to sort out or when Albania or Kosovo sure. and Serbia so we should not. Uh, we should avoid to put history in the middle of the European You're integration right. process. I agree very much. I'm so sorry. The time is up. Sorry, Ivan. Uh, we we are, uh, are at the I very end. One, one sentence. Half a Martha. second. Just, half yes. a second. If we were to have referenda on Sunday in all of our countries, you would have full majorities wanting to join the European Union. This is this is great. We lost the UK, but we are going to gain new countries, so let's hope so. Uh, thanks to all of you. Goodbye.